uh, you might want to have your say on some of the stories that we're about to discuss with Connor Tomlinson, Policy Director at the British Conservation Alliance uh, and also Young Voices UK contributor. Good morning, Connor. Good morning, Callum. I hope I don't sound too husky for most of your uh, listeners this morning. <laughs> not at all, not at all. We, we welcome uh, all early risers, so thanks for being up with us. Right, shall we start then with the front page of the Times, and indeed the implications of the front page of the Times. So, uh, there's a bit of a political squabble afoot here. The Treasury, uh, the Chancellor versus the Business Secretary, Quasi Quarteng, over help for factories. Um, but I think, Connor, you know, what, what's interesting about this story is concerns uh, for thousands of jobs because of the cost of energy in increasing to such a level that factories are now finding it so expensive and indeed unaffordable. Um, and where the government sits on this, uh, this squabbling is, is not that welcome in the face of potentially thousands of job losses. Yeah, the infighting between government departments has been a pretty concerning trend over the course of lockdown. And that's one of the main criticisms of why you shouldn't be putting so much tension on bureaucracy to run business, etc. Because you're putting people's livelihoods on a, on a tightrope walk between whether or not the minister to get on. The frustrating thing about this is it's all massively avoidable, a lot of the production capacity. Um, one of the main reasons we're in this spot in the first place is because we failed to prepare for, uh, with a lack of domestic manufacturing, for the fact that a lot of the fertilizer manufacturers just stop production of their CO2 for our production line. Um, we also failed to prepare to uh, accommodate for the fact that post lockdown there'd be a shortage of HGV drivers, not just because of the, the uh, shortage after they retired, but also because of the backlog of licenses. I know working at the moment trying to pass my driving test in my mid 20s, uh, there's been a nightmare to even try and book tests. And obviously, driving a HGV is a lot more difficult than a hatchback, but also because of the gas prices that are escalating. And we could have eased that international tension rather than relying on Russia and Qatar as some of our main energy suppliers. We could have alleviated a lot of that just by going to the US and saying, hey, to President Biden, first day you shut the Keystone XL, XL, XL rather, very difficult to say this time in the morning, pipeline and ratcheted up international energy prices when the US was prior energy independent and year on year decreasing their domestic emissions more than any other country. Um, instead of relying on uh, countries with incredibly spurious human rights records, weren't we buying our oil from you? And that's something that we could have could have definitely done. But all of these supply side issues are massive failures in, in politics and bureaucracy. And it's, it's unfortunate that working people are suffering. So as we start then this new week and uh, we wake up to headlines that thousands of jobs are at risk, potentially because of a, a lack of preparedness. And there's a, there's um, amazing quotes really about how this is almost catching. Um, officials by surprise. Uh, your blood ran cold, is, is the quote this morning. Uh, officials' blood ran cold when they kind of realised the scale of the potential problems for industries like steel, uh, for example, steel and chemical producers. Um, as we start this week, what should the government be doing? Of course, the Prime Minister is on his holidays in Marbella. So, that, I mean, this is down to the, the, the Treasury and the Business Secretary to work out this squabble and, and understand how to save potentially thousands of jobs. Yeah, well, the getaway to Spain is nice if it's nice work if you can get it. Um, obviously, I think the government should be looking to do some sort of supply side tax cut for all the industries that are massively affected because that's entirely on them. And rather than pu uh, pumping more public money into this and making the taxpayer pay even harder after the costs of their energy and their goods are going to go up, um, the, the company should just be keeping the money in the first place and, and allow it to patch over a lot of the pending debts. Uh, also, as I said originally, the international pressure to be leveraged on the US to try and reopen a, a more internationally friendly supply of energy would be pretty desirable. And we should be looking into investing, and I wrote a paper with the Adam Smith Institute on this, a, a, a sort of baseline for our grid so these sort of outages don't happen in future. France has got its nuclear power up and running brilliantly. Um, the problem with that is, of course, construction costs are very high and, and it takes about decades to knock up each of those plants. We've got size we'll see at the moment, mm. which is a good, good start, but uh, we haven't got the rest. So if we've got to invest in domestic uh, uh, fracking or uh, increasing our shale gas reserves, we have to look at that in a temporary period before we get between that and a, a fully renewable grid battery capacity isn't there at the moment uh, in the Times coverage of this, there's a really good uh, rundown of, uh, well, it's under the banner, where the lights are going out and the countries that are coping. Uh, so it goes through Lebanon, China, India, Germany, Sweden, Iran, Iraq, um, looking at the uh, power issues, electricity crisis, leaving China short of power, the gas crunch in Europe, hitting German industry, sending petrol and diesel prices soaring. It's a really good international look. And, and speaking of international, we mentioned the Prime Minister's holiday. Uh, John, Boris Johnson's on a week-long holiday in Marbella. He left Britain on Friday. Um, he's staying at the Costa del Sol, apparently in a property owned by Lord Goldsmith, um, which reportedly costs up to £25,000 a week to rent. 
Um, so that sounds like a pretty luxurious holiday uh, in any case. But there we are. The Prime Minister works hard, of course. Uh, shall we go on then to mention Wales uh, bringing in COVID passes? COVID passes now compulsory in Wales as of today uh, for large events, um, uh, you know, football, um, large events like that. Uh, nightclubs is the other one. I think that's probably another good, uh, obvious example. Um, COVID passes are an interesting one, Connor, aren't they? Because I think, uh, you know, Scotland tried to bring in its COVID pass um, over the last couple of weeks, faced lots of problems with getting the app activated, Wales now bringing this in today. It's interesting that there's disparity um, around the UK in terms of whether we want COVID passes and whether they're, they're being brought into use or not. Well, I think the general population is is very much on the side of this sort of policy is frankly evil, uh, unworkable and obstructs our civil liberties. Thankfully so. I think evil. the reason for the... Dis- Yes, well, because it completely inverts the common law standard of British relationship with the state. It makes it going from rather than a night watchman state which protects our liberties, instead it inverts some very much European model of like France and Germany, where the state is the progenitor, it affords people liberties, and that means at will it can take it away, um, which means it you know can restrict people from living generally uh, in the society as we as we've had under lockdown, where we we can't do anything unless the government explicitly tells us to, and it's produced a, a lot of uh, uh, pain and suffering for a lot of people, not least of all people that can exploit that in positions of power like Wayne Cousins who can exploit the uh, the COVID rules to to harm people and I think that's not a level of power that should be afforded to the government um, it's, we produce harm on the citizens when we do uh, when we keep the government as, as small a power scope over us as much as possible but I think the there's some, there's disparity some, there, there's some false comparisons there though isn't there Connor I mean the lockdown for example you know we'll, we'll stick with the lockdown comparison here mm. that's that's entirely different to being able to live freely in the interests of the safety of everyone I, I understand what you mean about the harms of lockdown and, and the research shows that there are many uh, but that's different to actually being able to go into a nightclub simply by by showing your COVID pass as you'll have to do in Wales. That, 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 well, just I, I disagree. I, I disagree because one, you, it's not about uh, your civil liberties should not be predicated on the state's permission. Let's put it that way. And also, the, the second reason why they're completely unworkable and, and unfair is because it's based on the false premise that zero COVID is possible. I mean, if you have a, a respiratory disease with animal reservoirs, you're going to get constant mutations which circumvent the vaccines. We've seen that with Delta. Um, and also, there's well, massive bureaucratic and circumvent costs. the vaccine. I think that's an unfair representation of what happens with or well, what you have, you have Delta breakthrough theory. cases, air quotes, which means that the vaccine is not like many other vaccines, um, completely preventable against it. It's severed the link between hospitalization and death. That's fantastic. But the entire premise of a zero COVID uh, COVID passport is so you can get to zero COVID so that people who are vaccinated won't have to uh, interact with the unvaccinated who might get them COVID. Well, if you're vaccinated, you can get COVID anyway. Have you you been vaccinated? I haven't actually, because uh, originally I was advised not to with the uh, AstraZeneca one, and then the Moderna's now having problems. The main one I was offered was Pfizer, but I'm actually anaphylactic. And the advice never changed, funnily enough, between uh, Pfizer saying, hey, this can give you an anaphylactic shock. Now it turned around and said, yeah, it can, but we'll just have an EpiPen on standby. So I'd rather hold off when I'm uh, more likely to not die from the uh, side effects of the vaccine than the actual vaccine. Okay, so so you're just not going to get vaccinated at all? Um, no, it seems like I'm, I'm going to be uh, stuck in the UK for, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, I was going to say, to fly, et cetera. That, will really, that will really limit what you can do. I know, and isn't that, well, isn't that the, uh, the injustice of it all, frankly, because I've already had COVID. And I, I can tell you for a fact, uh, I had it for about a day, but, and I just thought I was mildly hungover, um, which has happened more than once, if you can believe it, as a, as a former student. <laughs> Uh, it's, it is interesting, isn't it? The kind of uh, the impact on um, on what you can and can't do. I just, I yeah, I just, I, I find it so fascinating. I think it, it will leave people like you who have chosen not t- to get vaccinated for whatever reason, but mm. it will p- leave people like you somewhat behind as the rest of us go about our day to day lives quite happily, showing QR codes or, or not. Um, also, in terms of we're, we're paying working citizens, we're paying into the tax system, which is supported the NHS, especially with this uh, with this new national insurance rise, all the, all the infrastructure is going to be used for the NHS with a 42% tax rate that most graduates like me will be paying. We don't tell prisoners to pay for their own jail cells, but we are quite literally paying for the system, which would keep us from engaging in our civil liberties. And all that money is going to as well. The fact that the pharmaceutical companies, uh, other than AstraZeneca, who stood to not make a profit at this, and funnily enough, they were the only ones that didn't advise a booster jab, um, continually cranking out the booster jabs. And Again, if, if the virus mutates and we say, oh, okay, we need a new booster jab so this becomes more effective, then your gatekeeping is for liberties based on the amount of booster jabs you collect, almost like they're a form of Pokemon. It's, uh, it's not without cost and it's, it's not without its moral quandary. So I don't think it's, it's, 
particularly moral for the uh, the Welsh to engage in it. And that's what made me laugh when the Royal College of General Practitioners said, oh, well, we did, we applied it in France and it's worked out and the population seems to be taken to it. Someone clearly hasn't opened social media and had a look at the protests in the last few weeks because the population there aren't having it either. Connor, really nice to speak to you this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Cheers. That's Connor Tomlinson, Young Voices UK contributor.